Um, one of the most important things that you need to understand about identity theft is that it's not simply a credit-related problem, but very frequently it begins at a credit level, and it is important to understand how that, how that impacts you. If you have never received your credit report, it is highly important that you do so. Um, the goal being um, not necessarily to purchase your, not to purchase insurance to get your credit report, but utilize the free resources that you are entitled to on the web. If you, um, if you follow any of the government websites, the FTC.gov and follow the identity theft link, or IndianaConsumer.com, which is our Indiana Attorney General site, you should find links to get your credit report for free. You are entitled to one free credit report a year per agency. There are three credit bureaus. And so if you time that out correctly, you can get, at, at minimum, you can, uh, you can see your credit report four times, three times, once every four months, three times a year for free. But what is on your credit report? This kind of helps put the whole identity theft aspect into perspective. In terms of your credit report, you're going to see your name, your current address, your previous addresses, your employment data, last three employers, your account information, whether you've paid on time for your accounts or you've had a few uh, mishaps, any adverse account information, which would be those mishaps, and then also something called an inquiry. And an inquiry simply means that somebody has viewed your credit for the purposes of potentially extending new credit in the last um, 30 days as a, a new inquiry will show up on your credit report. Once, um, it's, once it's shown up on your credit report, if you've been approved, it usually takes an average of 30 days for that information to cycle around and become part of your credit history. So, excuse me, this is Velma. She's a very important part of our story. Um, she is, uh, she's an important part in terms of our learning about identity theft and exactly how, how it begins to happen. So, why should you care about identity theft? I frequently find that people who are not necessarily very in tune with having credit, we're talking about college campuses where credit is kind of a new aspect in many people's lives, they don't really concern themselves with the credit aspect. But credit is only one little aspect and that is that you, you may end up with higher interest rates, maxing out your available credit, and having bankruptcy issues if somebody has fraudulently used your information on, um, and used your information to apply for credit. But let's talk about the important stuff, and that's the things that most, most people are not talking enough about. What would happen, um, I assume that you all think the IRS is a highly efficient organization, um, but uh, the truth of the matter is, they are a government organization, and sometimes that means that there's a lag in, in terms of contacting you about things. What would happen if five years from now, you found out that the amount of income that you had reported, to the best of your knowledge, which is what you earned this year, was significantly different than the amount of income that the, the IRS had, in fact, labeled you as, and said, gee, um, sir, we have, um, we have information about you that we, we feel like you owe another $20,000 in taxes. The owner um, the owners has become your issue to prove then that you don't owe these taxes, which is rather, rather difficult because we think that we're organized and five years from now, it might be easier said than done to find the information that we have. Where did we get that information? Where has it been stored? Is it at the bank? Is it in a safe deposit box? Do, can you really collect all that information up and say, you know, here's the evidence that I have that I was actually living in, in this state and not another state while I was working? So that's important. Collected social security. What would happen? It's Right now, you're probably not at an age that retirement is highly on your uh, agenda, but possibly. But what would happen if you get to the point where it's time to collect Social Security and you found out somebody has already collected all of the Social Security that you are entitled to based on your legitimate earnings through your lifetime? It's kind of a, um, a rude awakening. Voter fraud. We're talking in election year, and goodness knows we have heard so much about politics that by now, if you're going to vote, you feel very passionately passionately about what your vote means. So, that having been said, it would be a rather um, traumatic experience to go attempt to vote and find out somebody has already voted in your name using your information. This is another form of identity theft. Please come in. Uh, criminal history. And this is one that I really feel like is very, very important. Um, what would happen if your daughter, your sister, your um, nephew or niece Work, went to a school and had um, an experience with a predator who had falsely passed a background check using someone else's identification. This is one of those situations where criminals do not commit crimes in most instances 
using their own identification. They lease apartments to sell crack and they do drugs, deal um, in stolen merchandise and illicit situations using someone else's identification. If you get a knock at your door someday from the police saying you committed a crime and, and you now need to go to the, um, to the courthouse, that's kind of a challenging thing. You have to go back and you have to prove that you know that wasn't really you. What if you got pulled over for a speeding ticket thinking you had a minor infraction and the next thing you know, there are warrants out for your arrest because someone has falsified your identity. This is another form of identity theft. Um, so false traffic uh, violations, terrorist activity and public safety. These are just scratching the surface of identity theft. But this is why the most important thing that we can do is focus on prevention and not how to fix it afterwards, but how do we prevent it from happening? We don't spray our social security number on the side of a bus. It's just not a good idea. So how serious is the problem? Well, on average, I speak on this, oh my goodness, I, sp I speak constantly on this topic, and I have very, very rarely ever been in a room where statistically one in eight people have not, at minimum, been a victim of identity theft already. Well, now, why do, why, what's the significance of the one in eight? The FTC, according to the most recent survey on identity theft specifically, which was done in 2002, says 12.7%. Mathematically, that's about one in every eight. So at every banquet table we sit, we have events, one of those individuals has raised their hand to say, I've been a victim, and I will maintain that more than one on average. And what this tells us is, this is, a, this is a living statistic. Every moment it's changing, every moment it's growing. It's very difficult to get your arms around identity theft in terms of statistics because most people don't understand it and most people real, don't realize that they've been a victim necessarily instantly. So let's talk about main points of identification. These are the, these are the points of identification that you can't avoid. You share these every day, all day long your full name, your street address, your city state zip, your phone numbers, and your birthday. We would agree that unfortunately we give these pieces of information out all the time. So what about additional points of identification? You have your spouse's name, your social security number, your mother's maiden name, city of birth, employer, and your password. Let me tell you something really important about passwords. This is my dog. His name is Max, we'll call him Max. Max is a great dog, but Max is not a smart password. Why is Max not a smart password? Because passwords um, are meant to protect us, and if they're all letters, and they're all, even worse, letters with just lowercase, they're hacked very easily. Hacking software works very, very much like a slot machine. We're all there watching and hoping that we hit the jackpot. Well, that hacking software gets into your system um, via many methods, and we'll talk about those in a little bit, and it goes very quickly through. So all letters are likely to get hit faster than letters and numbers. Letters, numbers, and symbols, even more. Upper and lower case, even more. And now at this point in time, you're thinking, yeah, that's great, but now I've got a password that I probably can't remember. Um, very simple. I don't suggest everyone run out and use this password. This is just an example. A uh, good friend, uh, um, had given a long time ago, and I thought it was really brilliant. What this is, is a phraseology, if you will, of a good password. And it looks wretchedly complicated and difficult to remember. It's actually most people's New Year's resolution. I want to lose 10 pounds. This <laughs> is easy to remember if you're trying to remember the phrase, but difficult to hack. Now, please, ladies and gentlemen, do not run out and change your passwords. I want to lose five pounds. But do try to take a little bit of time and understand why IT seems to have such a sense of urgency about making those passwords more complicated. Because lucky numbers, bank pins, these are not good ideas for passwords. I will tell you, I spend my days um, in, in my day job, I am a business consultant. So I work with people all the time on their systems, on hard skills, soft skills. And a lot of times we sit down and we try to get into someone's um, computer and, they'll, and they will have trouble with their password. Well, immediately, they have to look for it. It's in the little yellow post-it note stuck to the monitor. It's in the right-hand desk drawer. It's in a frame next to their computer. It only takes a little while to, to, to prompt them on how to remember what their password is. But this means it only takes a little while to hack it. 
So let's get into uh, the, the story just a little bit about why it is that I'm standing here in front of you telling you I've been a victim and now I'm an advocate and sure lots of people have been a victim. I think uh, Senator Harry Reid told everyone that he had been a victim of identity theft. I, as I understand it, it was actually not identity theft, it was credit card fraud. And um, there is a distinct difference, although credit card fraud can be a stepping stone from crime to identity theft, it's very important to understand that there is a distinction. Um, I worked in the, in the music industry a long time ago. That's where I met my husband. Um, I worked, uh, actually, um, I worked locally and regionally, and then I ended up touring, and I went out on the road with you 2 and Neil Diamond, and I had a fun, exciting life, but I decided that it was time to settle down, and I wanted to, uh, um, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to get a place of my own and start to uh, kind, of, kind of settling down, left the road life. Okay. Well, as luck would have it, I went and I filled out what we've all filled out in our lifetime, the job application. Now, what was on this job application? I decided at the time I was going to work at a hotel in downtown Indianapolis because it just seemed like a good idea at the time. And um, I, I actually proudly filled out this job application um, for a, a management position, and I handed it to the front desk clerk with a smile, and he said, wonderful, have a seat. Someone will be with you in just a moment. And essentially what happened is that job application was copied and stuffed in a duffel bag, and off it went into an identity theft gang ring um, where he started using my identity, first of all, to apply for credit cards. And uh, I got my credit report because, remember I told you about the inquiries, this is really important. Um, I went to apply for credit on my first couch. I was so excited. I went to get my, uh, to get my couch and uh, six months same as cash, wonderful little deal. And uh, when luck would have it, as I was checking out, the girl told me I was approved. I thought, wonderful. She said, but sweetheart, you need to slow down on the credit card applications because you don't want to get every credit card you're ever going to have all at once. And I said, credit card applications? I didn't fill out any credit card applications except this one. And she said, you didn't? And I said, no. She said, well, then you need to get your credit report. And that was some very good advice because by the time I could get my credit report and get a copy of it, I already had $10,000 worth of charges on my credit and credit cards opened up in my name that didn't belong to me. Now, earlier I told you about your points of identification. A lot of these points of identification are the same as what you'll find on a job application. And what you find is the credit bureau reports are also very similar. So someone had this insight to my world in terms of initially in the credit aspect right off the bat. Well, being the kind of uh, determined personality that I am, I decided that I was not going to let this rest until I figured out where I had gone wrong, what I had done that made me stupid, if you will, um, and it caused this problem. So this was in the mid-90s. We'll, we'll call it CSI, Indianapolis, 1990, actually 94. But what happened was um, I started getting copies. Every time I would check my credit report, I would call the credit bureau. At that point in time, it was pre-Fair Credit Reporting Act of 1994, but it was, um, but the bureaus at least had a person that you could talk to. It wasn't quite so automated because we didn't have the percentage of problem that we do now. And I made a friend in the credit bureau who I'm eternally grateful, and I won't give her name because every victim of identity theft would be calling her for the rest of their lives. But um, she helped me on a daily basis check to see what new inquiries had shown up so that I would call those companies and say, someone has applied for application of credit in my name, and I'd like to have a copy of the application, and I'd like you to stop it as much as you can, minimize the, the activity in the account. Let's close the account immediately. So I was trying to minimize the damages, and my minimization of the damages still ended up with $30,000 worth of credit, a house in the crack district in downtown Indianapolis that I really never lived in, and um, it gets better because I also had a house in the low-income housing district in Danville, Illinois because he was part of a gang ring. And as the information happened um, and someone sort of got close to him, he would give the information to someone else and, and they would perpetrate the, the crime elsewhere to throw the cops off, basically. And why not? I had great credit at the time, or at least for a little while. So night and day, day and night, I'm poring over these applications. And thank goodness for the time zone difference because I was able to call her, get a little information three hours at the end of the day, made a lot of difference for me. And, um, and I continued to pour over these applications. Had them spread chronologically in one spot, had them copy spread alphabetically in another, and I'm looking at every single piece of information. One day, I went um, to an application and found something different than I had ever seen before. 
It was an American Express application, and in fact, that American Express application had asked for something that none of the other credit applications had asked for. American Express is slightly more discerning, I think, than some of the other major credit card companies, and they wanted a checking account number. Hmm. Well, so this, this, this account number, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, it kind of looks right, but it doesn't exactly look right. So what, what's going on here? First set of numbers here is the routing number. And the second set of numbers, and that routing number is associated with your bank. This is obviously a fake check, so, um, but just for example purposes. The second set of numbers is actually the bank account number. And the final set of numbers matches the check number in the corner. So if you're not already familiar with that, um, then, then you are now, but if you were familiar with that, then you are one step smarter than the criminal that actually perpetrated the crime against me. Because when he filled out, when he filled out the credit applications, he used the checking account number, and he put four numbers too many. And I thought, wait a minute, something, something is, this is, I'm really onto something here. And so what we surmised was that he was probably, he obviously had access to my purse, because that check was a clear check and I had it. So he never stole the check, but he had touched my checkbook. Now I got the job, ladies and gentlemen, and this was a four-star hotel in downtown Indianapolis. I got that job. They never did a background check on their employees because if they had, they would have known the gentleman they hired to run the front desk and to take the applications and to watch our purses as the break room, uh, in the break room, was actually a criminal with nine criminal history uh, items on his uh, criminal record before he even started to work with me. But he did take my purse from the break room, and at the time, I wasn't in that mode of watching my stuff all the time, because I had never even heard of identity theft, and I was broke, because I didn't have any cash, so what did it matter? But my checkbook was in my purse, and he's filling out these applications while he's likely on the clock, and he is writing away. So what I figured is, he probably had a record, because he was really good and he racked up stuff so fast and so effectively that I had a feeling that this guy probably had a record. If he had a record, he was arrested. If he had been arrested, then his prints would have been in the system. So I called the Postal Inspection Service, um, the uh, postal inspector that was working with me, and I explained to him what I had believed had happened. And he knew. He had seen my living room and my dining room, and he knew I wasn't going to quit until I figured out who it was. So, lo and behold, he took that check and he ran it for prints. I handed it to him in a Ziploc bag and I was proud as punch because I, I thought, okay, good, we're going to figure out who this is. It took a little time, but as he, as he came back and told me that the gentleman that the prints belonged to had nine arrests prior and he was currently working with me at the hotel. Now, um, as it stood, I was excited because I presumed that meant they were going to arrest him. but. Instead, he turned over members of his gang ring and walked. And I, I, would, I would be inclined to tell you that if we ran a criminal history check on this guy now, he's probably just got a longer record. Because the problem with identity theft is it is difficult to prosecute because it's a constantly moving crime. Multiple people have their hands on it, it's in multiple jurisdictions, and people do not understand. This is why I'm so grateful that the Indiana Attorney General's Office has gotten involved, because they assist the law enforcement in making sure that that interjurisdictional nightmare that you experience kind of gets minimized a little bit. So, okay, now remember Velma, I told you that she was important at the beginning. Um, these are my college roommates. Okay, I look a little older than that, but we're gonna humor me. These are my college roommates. This is my college roommate's sister. They play bridge every week. Okay, she plays bridge, but someone in her bridge group happens to be sick, so she sends a sub, and her name is Velma. Velma is not a victim of identity theft. Velma is actually in a crime ring. Velma has gotten herself into a desperate situation, and I know, I get the same looks. That couldn't possibly be a criminal. She is clip art Velma, so I, I, I know that someone at one point in time really posed for this. This is a proverbial <laughs> example. But the, um, the concept here is, there is no face of the identity theft criminal. You are just as likely to look to your right or your left and see someone who could potentially be a criminal in this type of crime than anything. I, I talk about gangs and depending on the generation, I get two perspectives. One is Bloods and Crips and LA and spray paint and goofy people who don't have any better sense than having grown up yet. 
and the other is West Side Story. And it depends on the age group um, that I'm speaking for, but the reality of it is a gang ring for identity theft doesn't look like either of these two things. They're just people who happen to be working collectively to share information and, and get a little bit over on the system and use some of that information. Now, why would somebody like Velma become an identity theft, uh, an identity thief? Well, if she's living at home and her husband's passed away and she's got three kids, they've all moved back in with her, one of them left and left her with their kids, and one of those children needs an operation and she's living on a very, very modest pension, she may turn to accidentally happen upon uh, an opportunity to take advantage of a situation and while it is a white collar crime, I hear that a lot, well, there is no victim, nobody really gets hurt. It's, it's amazing how much damage the stress and the aggravation, I, I know I attended school at one point in time in college and my, my situation got so bad that I had to be reissued a new social security number. So I'm thinking, wonderful, I've got a new social security number, I can get out from underneath this credit issue. Yeah, the credit was the, the half of it. Then I spend the next two years carrying around a little brown envelope with, that says, I'm really not a man, and I really don't live in the, uh, in the correct district in, in downtown Indianapolis, and I don't have government housing, and I really do have legitimate credit. And now you're thinking, why would they think I was a man? My first name is gender neutral. I'm Jamie Michelle. Jamie Michelle's credit report then said Jamie Michael. Then the next step on the credit report change, every application that happens is submitted to the credit bureau, and that's how the credit bureaus get their information. There's also a presumption that there is a, a the government issues you your social security number and that automatically gives you a credit bureau report. That's not how it works. It happens that somebody fills out an application and they take that for, for a fact. And then everything from then on is compared to it at the state of an inquiry and then handed and passed through. So what, what happened is, my information is falling off. My real information, my real identity, is not associated on my credit bureau reports in any way. So this is what happens with identity theft. And while it may seem like it's harmless, it's very challenging. You have to fill out lots and lots of affidavits, or if you happen to have insurance, you have to sign away your uh, legal um, status in the form of a, um, oh shoot, what is the, uh, um, excuse me, it'll come to me in just a minute. Well, you, you, have to, you have to sign that someone has the right to represent you. In power. power of attorney, thank you very much. I'm sorry, it's, uh, I know it's getting late, so you'll have to humor me. Merchant copy and customer copy. These are important aspects. Um, in the state of Indiana, and this is a state-by-state -state law, so it's not necessarily a guarantee that this is true of every state, but in the state of Indiana, they have updated the laws to indicate that on a customer receipt, it is illegal to print the entire credit card number. However, you get two copies of receipts in most instances. You go to dinner and you get two copies of your receipt. You get a merchant's copy and a, and a customer copy. It is not illegal for the merchant's copy to contain the entire credit card number. So what does that mean? That means it's being visibly seen by every hand that it passes through. Perhaps it's sitting at a restaurant when you're um, going in. I went into a restaurant not that long ago for carryout to pick it up, and there's the stack of credit card receipts, and it's an old machine. The point of sale machine was, was older. It's still printing out all the numbers, and, and there they sit. I could have very easily copied those pieces of information down. Or worse, you think you're grabbing the merchant copy, or the customer copy, and you really grab the merchant copy. You sign the other one because it really doesn't matter, right? They look just alike. No, not always. You leave it, and then you throw away your receipt somewhere without shredding that information, and you've exposed yourself in a new vulnerability. This is a very important thing to be aware. Take a nice black Sharpie and mark out of those numbers, all but the last four. You're entitled to do that. It helps you be safer. It also brings awareness to the company who's got an older merchant point of sale machine that they might, for best practice purposes, need to contact that company. So watch, when those machines look older, or you're looking at a machine that has, um, or you're looking at a receipt that has all of those numbers on it, at least bring it to someone's attention. Now, cash, good old fashioned cash. Long time ago, we used to use cash for everything. Now we use credit for everything, and debit cards for everything. But there are places where you are less likely to have an updated, formal, nice point of sale machine to print out your receipt 
sometimes we're talking about old credit, copy uh, carbons that they have to push the machine back and forth over. So where do you have the possibility of seeing those kinds of places? Anywhere that's transient. We've got fairs, festivals, sporting events, boutiques, art fairs, fundraisers, deliveries. All of these are really important places to consider not sharing your credit card number with. The problem is not the Boy Scout who comes to the door for his popcorn fundraiser. The problem is if you write a check to that Boy Scout and he takes that check and he gives it to his mom and his mom is driving to take it to the Cub Scout leader and she stops four places in between, gets her car changed, her oil changed at the, uh, at the, you know, oil lube place and that information is exposed. The Boy Scout's not the problem. They're wonderful. The fundraiser's not the problem. Fundraisers are great. The problem is you are, it's easy to think about identity theft in terms of who is right in your circle, you know, that six degrees of, but it's not the first degree that's usually the problem. It's the second degree. It's the third degree that you get into, and people cross paths with your information. So watch this kind of stuff. Um, fundraisers and deliveries. We talked about gang rings. We also need to talk about mistyped addresses. You can believe you're going to a wonderful identity theft prevention site or a site to get your credit report. If you mistype your address, you can be on a false um, site filling out all your wonderful information and sharing it with somebody overseas who's going to sell it on the internet and make big bucks. So be very careful when you type those addresses. It's a good idea to start at a government-based website and follow the links because you're just a little bit better off. Do you know the difference between HTTP and HTTPS? Perhaps, but if you don't, the S stands for secure. That S sound should remind you that it's secure. So if you're putting in information into, into the computer that has anything on it that you don't want shared with the rest of the world in mass, you better make sure the S is there before you put anything on. And the padlock is closed. So if you have the kind of web um, browser that includes the padlock at the bottom, it should not be open, it should be closed, and it should be present. If you see the S and the padlock, you know you're in good shape. What about jump drives? We use jump drives all the time. They can actually contain spyware that you never see that loads onto your computer that helps that hacking software. And it's not impossible that your jump drives contain spyware, so you need to virus scan them too. Safe passwords, we talked about the importance of uh, having good passwords. And um, know that you have different correspondence methods that will change what you should share. When it's time for tax time and you're emailing your accountant back and forth, you better make sure your accountant has enough sense to password protect those PDFs when they're showing you what your tax forms are going to look like. Because if they just send you an unprotected document, it is only as good as the web server and every other web server that it's passed through. So, phishing, the term phishing comes from throwing out bait and seeing who's dumb enough to bite. And so phishing is actually um, a, a very popular form of, you must check this link, follow this link, and, or we're gonna close your account, validate your information, we're gonna close your account in 24 hours. Let me tell you, anybody that is willing to close your account in 24 hours is not a real legitimate vendor anyway. So beware, um, that phishing can get you into big trouble. Okay, that's with our clever little things. Email, mail, correspondence is important too. That little red flag that's on the side of your mailbox is actually a little red flag that says, come steal information from me. Do not put information outgoing in your mailbox. Take it to the United States Postal Service, drop it in the blue bin and make sure nobody can stick their arm in and grab it back out. If it's that full, take it another day or take it to another um, mailbox. We talked about emailing. There's a difference between emailing file links and emailing attachments. File links are, um, are a whole different ballgame than attachments, but many times we send information in file attachments without password encoding, and, and that's really important. Uh, minimize the risk. For anybody that was ever a Seinfeld fan, you, you remember the Costanza wallet joke, um, but it, it's simply a wallet that looks like it's going to burst um, because you've got so much information in there. If you have a wallet like this, then odds are you're carrying around a lot more information about you than you really care to give to the rest of the world. So a good wind, an explosion of your wallet could cause some problems. But let's talk about the bigger picture here. Taking most everything out of your wallet, but what is critical to have, is very helpful. 
I'm frugal, so I have all these shopper cards. Well, these shopper cards can actually get me into trouble because if I have one um, Visa tucked in 400 shopper cards and I lose it, I may not necessarily realize I've lost it until it's too late. So what we want to do is put these shopper cards on a ring. You can get these rings right at the office supply place, poke a little hole in them, and then keep them outside of your wallet. So your wallet doesn't look like this, and if it's full of old receipts, odds are if you look through it, you'll find some receipts with credit card numbers fully on it that you don't want. Get rid of those too. Veterans cards and Medicare cards, you know, maybe you're not using them right now, but maybe you are. Social security cards, these are not things that you should be carrying with you everywhere. And I hear a lot of people say, well, we need our, we need our Medicare card or Medicaid card. You, you will have it at home and somebody can go get it for you if you really need it and you're in an emergency. If you're not in an emergency, you're probably planning, pull it out when you go to the doctor and put it back when you're done. You, you don't want the risk of having this on your person all the time. Um, also, I talk a lot about information denial. What you, what you fill out when you fill out these frequent shopper card applications, you're giving away all this information about you. When you put your name and address and your birth date in the fishbowl to be drawn for some cruise giveaway, you know, you're, you're taking your own uh, information at risk and deciding to share that information. So you need to make sure that you're selective about who you choose to share that information with. And um, also, hotels and travel. Hotels are one of the worst hotbeds for identity theft because the nature of the crime, the nature of the, crim, um, the victim in those, in those cases is transient. They move from city to city, from hotel to hotel. So it's harder to make the connection that a breach of security has happened, if you will, if everybody goes home to a different city. If we all live right here in the same town and there was a problem at a specific store, conversation would happen and we probably make that connection, but by virtue of the fact that they're transient locations, it's harder. So watch out when you're checking in, what you share information-wise, what you use to travel with, make sure it's a credit card that you're watching the, the, the statements on very frequently. Watch your room security. Hiding your laptop in between the pillows is not as secure as you think it is. Um, while you're out, and then valets. Are you giving your keys to the valet? If so, just like when you take your car to the oil change, what's in the car when you hand over your keys? Because these are locations for people to, um, to take uh, advantage. Spotting fake IDs. If you happen to work in an industry where you, where you are spotting identification or validating identification, truly put some effort into it. Um, watch the inconsistency of details. Uh, expired dates, duplicate, indicated, that's a flag. If the height and weight is radically different than the person that you're meeting, there's a problem. No, to my knowledge, no state has a blank back on their card. At minimum, you have some kind of scan code or something. So if you see, if you flip someone's driver's license over because you believe it to be fraudulent potentially, and it's blank, very well may be. And the thickness, if it's been relaminated over and over again. So trust your instincts. Many times people that tell me they had an incident with a criminal will say, I had a feeling, I should have listened to that feeling. Yes, you should listen to those feelings. Now, creating fake IDs. For college age students, many times, fake IDs have an allure to them that have nothing to do with identity theft. They don't really mean anything by it, right? Well, they may not mean anything by it, but that doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't have an effect on, on the students. So creating fake IDs is a bad idea. Don't give your birth certificate and information so that somebody else can go down and get an ID. Um, it's, just, it's just bad at practice. Don't give your information, don't give your card to somebody who looks kind of like you so that they can go bar hopping. So this is not, it's not worth the, the risk. Be aware of your surroundings. Who's over your shoulder? Where do you have security cameras? Gosh, there's security cameras everywhere. How much information are you just leaving out there for the world? What are you discussing on your cell phone? because a good old ham radio that are illegal to have the ham radios that actually can pick up the signal, but they can still be obtained. And those ham radios can pick up all sorts of airwave signals, and so you're out shopping and you're calling in, you get there and they decline your card so you realize you didn't make your payment, you call it in, you're telling them all your great password information and your birth date and your ID and all that good stuff while you're on your cell phone, and guess what? You know, somebody can pick up that information. 
So, and having your car serviced. I think I made that point fairly well. So, let's talk, what else? We're at a college campus, so let's talk a little college for just a moment. Parties, where do you put your purse or your wallets when you're at parties? Clubs, out dancing, you gonna run a tab? Give your credit card, your ID to the bartender and leave it on the bar? Do you really think that bartender is gonna watch that card all night long? You think they're gonna turn to, to deal with ice and drinks and all of that other stuff? Do not run a tab at a, at a place and leave your information in somebody else's hands where somebody has, somebody, anyone can reach over and grab it. It's just a bad practice. When you go to dinners, sporting events, or hospital stays, keep your purses and your wallets with you. If you're a golfer, keep your wallet with you. Don't stick it in the golf bag and then walk off and then come back. Um, this is a trash can. Wow, that's an epiphany of a statement, isn't it? But it is a hotbed for dumping grounds for identity theft incidents. Because people get their trash, they get their mail in the car, they look through their mail, they put the good stuff on the seat, they put the other stuff in the side, then they go to the gas station or the car wash, and they dump all that stuff in the gas station or car wash trash can. Well, guess what? Where, if I'm gonna look for somebody's identity to breach, the gas station and the car wash are a prime place to do it. I hope, I hope that that's not what anybody's watching this video for, but we gotta be smart. You know, who we hand our keys to, you know, the chair at Starbucks or the local coffee shop. You know, if you're more worried about claiming the chair because it's the comfortable chair than you are about what's gonna happen to your identity when you leave your purse there and somebody else claims it, then, you know, I hope you enjoy the latte. But the reality of this, we, it's not worth it. Okay, so, new hot item. If you're not familiar with the, the pharma parties, they are the new thing. What's a pharma party? A pharma party means that your admission, your cover charge to get into the party is a prescription. We aren't gonna ask where they come from. Most of the time they aren't the person whose name is on the label, but this label becomes a two for one coupon. You can party, you, you drop the drugs in the bowl, you stir them up and you take your jelly bean like everybody else, and they wait. They sit and wait for side effects. I, I can't fathom this this thought, but this is what is happening with the parties today. So they're dumping these prescription bottles out and dropping them behind. And what's on that prescription? Your name, your prescription, your refill date, which is or your um, your fill date, which is likely when you went to the doctor. Your address of your pharmacy, which is likely close to your house or close to your doctor's, or more than likely both. What you're taking, you can search doctor internet and figure out what somebody's taking and what they are probably taking it for. And somebody can place a very clever phone call to you and explain to you how the pharmacy's computer system crashed and they don't want to get fired, so could you please just give them the credit card number again, they've got your last four digits, or they want to verify, they've given you enough information off the label that you feel like you're talking to the real person, and the next thing you know, you have compromised your identity because somebody has that information, or even easier, they can go into a chat room and sell this information on the internet. They get money for having names, they get more money for having addresses, they get more money for having addresses, names, and social security numbers, yet even more money if you can throw in a mother's maiden name or a password. So it's a hotbed. These pharma parties have a connection to your pharmaceuticals. Your pharmaceuticals being improperly disposed with the label can really cause you a problem. So in the community shred days, they are now offering, in many instances, pharmaceutical uh, disposal. Take advantage of it. So risks for identity theft are very much like germs. What can you do as students to minimize the risk? Well, once upon a time, we did not understand that there was such a thing as a germ and we had surgeries that weren't sterile, and we didn't worry about it. This is a kind of a discussion of potential paranoia. Sure, everything I do, I'm at risk for. There are germs out there, there are risk factors for identity theft out there. We don't suddenly buy health insurance and then stop washing our hands. So if you do buy insurance, you need to make sure that you are smart about your preventive measures anyway, and minimize the risk for other people that may happen. Yeah, great, somebody can bail you out of trouble, but does that prevent someone else from becoming a victim of a crime because somebody had access to your information to begin with? Be smart, use good practices, and certainly don't live your life paranoid, but do, very, very, very much so, do be aware that there are ways to be intelligent, to be smart about your, um, your information. So be mindful of new knowledge. 
Uh, IndianaConsumer.com, we have our 1-800 number. I do have victim kits, but if you have been a victim of identity theft and live in the state of Indiana, it is extremely important that you contact the Attorney General's office and let them assist you in the process of repairing your um, identity.